Good morning. <coughs> so it's a joint paper with a colleague of mine in uh, Sherbrooke University in Quebec. And um, that was an experimental study done with uh, students on the notion of perceived risk when we are giving a different kind of information to the student concerning the, the risk they may face when they're buying a, buying a bottle of wine. So uh, it's going to be a short presentation, so I'm probably not going to be able to go through all the paper, but I'm going to pinpoint the, the main points. So I need to go through some of the definition we're using in the questionnaires. Uh, then I'll explain the context of the experimental invitation, the experimentation, and I'll give you some, uh, some of the results of the, the study. So the uh, basic idea is to make the difference between the kind of information we're providing to the students in terms of the uh, nature of the risk they're facing when they're buying a, a bottle of wine. And uh, we took the hypothesis that they could buy the bottle of wine that could be corked or not corked. And they may or may not have any information on the probability that the bottle may or may not be corked. So the, the first situation is a known risk. It's like coin, uh, tossing a coin. So we're giving the exact probability of uh, getting a corked bottle of wine when you buy the, the bottle. The, the next possibility is that you have no information at all. It's like the Erzberg urn problem, where you don't know how many red balls or black balls you have in the urn, and you're facing uh, to have to take a decision without knowing anything about the uh, probability of uh, having facing the risk. Then you have the what we refer as to ambiguity, where you have some information but the information is ambiguous because you have a range of probabilities. So you have more information than in the uncertainty case. But there is a problem with the information because the information you get it may be different depending on the range of probability you're providing to the students or to the participants to the, the survey. So this is basically the hypothesis we've been testing. Concern I understand if you put this here, it solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, this is what we, we're testing. And then the next step, and this is something we're still ongoing, in the, and, but we could still proceed with this today with uh, students. So basically, the first hypothesis is uncertainty. The second one is ambiguity. There could be a third case, which is situation of conflict where you have two experts. If they give the same information, then you have in a non-risk situation. If they're giving two different information, then you have a situation of conflict, which may be different from ambiguity, because you have two experts giving two different information. That's the situation too. And you could have a third situation that we have not explored yet, where each expert is giving you a range, so you have both uncertainty ambiguity and conflict within the information that is given to you. Okay. So basically we, we're going to test one, two and uh, situation three in the case of uh, conflict in this paper. So what is the, uh, the experiment we've been running? This was done uh, with the uh, hypothesis that students may be able to buy a bottle in a case of 12 bottle without knowing or, knowing or getting some information about the risk of getting a corked bottle. Uh, the design of a questionnaire, we've used old questionnaire to, to design the same kind of questionnaire and the, the, the investigation was uh, undertaken in Quebec uh, with undergraduate students from 2012 to 2014 in several uh, samples, several classes. Uh, with uh, every time random distribution of questionnaires, so the student didn't know uh, what was the, uh, the question of a neighbor. They may have different, different questions. Uh, the idea was uh, buying a wine in uh, a tax-free zone in an airport, so there is no way you can bring back the bottle. Okay. And uh, the risk was the possibility of uh, getting a corked bottle in a case of 12 bottles. Okay, so that was the hypothesis. Now, uh, the uncertainty case is 
the Ellsberg un problem, you have no information. Ambiguity, you have a maximum and minimum probability. Known risk is one bottle out of 12 in a case, so the probability is known. Okay? Um, we ask also several of us questions concerning the uh, prior experience that the students may have concerning uh, corked bottle. Um, their probability of uh, having getting a corked bottle in the case of 12 uh, and other statistics that we determine. Uh, so the, the uh, study was done with students. The context was buying a bottle of wine and the price would vary from 5 to 220. 220 is a high price, but it was selected on purpose to force the demand curve to be zero. Okay, of course, if you're dealing with uh, older people, uh, the 220 may not be a high price. For students, 220 is a very high price. So we were sure that the, in fact, we did several experiments and uh, we decided to select 220 to make sure that the demand curve will go to zero. Uh, the risky prospect is a case of 12 bottle. This is an example of question. Uh, you want to buy a bottle of wine value $10, but you don't know if there is a possibility that you may buy a corked bottle. Do you buy the bottle? There's only one answer possible is yes or no. Okay. Uh, there's only one question, and the students don't have a possibility to change their mind later on. So it's a just one shot question. Uh, the uh, risky prospect, this is the kind of question we're asking. You want to buy a bottle of wine value $10 and the manager knows for sure that there is always one corked bottle in a case of 12. So you know the exact probability of getting a corked bottle. Uh, number of participants was 325. 36 students didn't want to buy wine at all. Uh, only a few answers were inconsistent, which means they were not uh, mono monotonic demand, declining demand curve, so we, these uh, answers were dropped. Uh, average age was 21, 22, 50, 50 male, female almost. <coughs> uh, in each question, uh, we ask uh, if, uh, what was the price habits of students? So how much they would be willing to pay for a bottle of wine uh, if invited to a friend's party. Uh, the perceived risk for a cocktail bottle, the sex and age. And different question on the trait of personality of the students in order to be able to uh, do some uh, check on the, on the results later on. Uh, so I want to show you the, uh, the results of the first two hypotheses, which is either ambiguity or known risk situation. So this is, uh, this is the first kind of demand curve we're getting. And uh, what we're getting here is that according, and it's according to the literature, that people would prefer known risk to an uncertain situation. Okay? And if you look at the result, the demand curve for known risk is over the demand curve for uncertainty, which confirm the uh, the preference for a known risk situation. If you look at ambiguity, the question was this kind of question where the probability that you may get a corked bottle varies between 2 and 8 percent. Do you buy the bottle? And this is the kind of result we're getting. And the two demand curves are almost similar. The main reason is that the ambiguity you're giving to the students 2 to 8 percent is below the non-risk situation, which you would not expect in difference between the two demand curves. And the perceived risk by students was around 7% on average for all the groups, which means they had a perceived risk which was, if they anchored to their perceived risk, was almost as high as the ambiguity range we're giving to the students. So it's not surprising that we're not getting any difference between the, the two curves. So what we did later on is to change the range of ambiguity given to the students, and this is what we 
getting here if we change the rent from 7 to 15 percent which is over their average perceived risk <coughs> this is what we're getting okay ambiguity one refers to the first situation ambiguity two is the new situation uh, the demand curve is dropping because you're increasing the ambiguity provided to the uh, respondents okay you're giving them a range of ambiguity that is over their average perceived risk of this the situation of getting a corked bottle. We did the same thing with conflicts and we, this is the kind of demand curve we're getting for conflicts. Okay, I'm almost finished. Okay, so basically these were the demand curve. When we did next is to do some check and robustness of the results uh, by doing some analysis, uh, empirical analysis of the willingness to buy and the willingness to pay. Uh, I, I won't have time to go through the, the result, but basically we, we're checking whether or not the age, the gender, the trait of characters have an impact on the, on the demand curve. Uh, and we're finding the expected results for these uh, willingness to pay and willingness to buy. So what, uh, what we still can do is uh, change, play with uh, probabilities, okay? Uh, and the marketing implications are that if you have uh, known information, uh, it's always better to, to give the exact information concerning the quality of a wine than to let the, the people have ambiguity or uncertainty about the quality of the wine. And uh, the, the next step is also that uh, this was done with students and of course if you replicate this with adults, uh, first the buying power, power may not be the same, uh, the knowledge concerning uh, wine or quality of wine may not be the same, so it may impact the results. So there's still a lot of uh, possibilities to uh, enlarge this kind of uh, study, experimental study or questionnaire with uh, uh, adults rather than, uh, than students. So I still have time. No, I'm, uh, I'm rushing, but <laughs> I don't have much time. This, the, uh, so thank you for your attention and, and your comments.